Next speaker is Jennifer McPartland. Um, she uh, received a, a bachelor's in biochemistry from the University of Virginia. Um, her PhD uh, in molecular genetics and cell biology from the University of Chicago and is now a senior scientist in the health program at the Environmental Defense Fund. Um, uh, Jennifer's expertise is actually at that really uh, tricky interface of science policy and market-based action. And um, um, there's a lot I could say about you, but I will just say that, um, that what I think is really cool uh, is the fact that you just released a podcast, right? Oh, yeah. Called You Make Me Sick. Um, so <laughs> that's what it's called. Um, and yeah, so uh, please go and check it out. I'm already sweating at the brow to get through this in 10 minutes, but I'm going to do my best. All right, so um, as Patrick said, I'm a senior scientist in the health program at Environmental Defense Fund, and our goal in the health program is to reduce the public's exposures to harmful chemicals. Um, and I'm gonna share a couple of examples about how we go about achieving this goal. Um, but before starting on that, I, th I thought it might be helpful to give just a little bit of background on the Environmental Defense Fund for those of you who may not be familiar with the organization. So um, we're actually celebrating our 50th year this year. Uh, I just flew back from Cambridge, Maryland, where the entire organization was gathered um, for our annual retreat and very, very ecstatic to be celebrating 50 years. Um, we uh, actually were started by a small group of uh, scientists, lawyers, and teachers on Long Island that all shared a common concern around declining populations of certain birds of prey, including ospreys, falcons, bald eagles. Um, and what one of these uh, uh, individuals determined was that the culprit was the aerial spraying of DDT to control for uh, mosquitoes, which you can see here. Uh, these, tray, uh, these trucks driving around and just blasting um, DDT and children um, running behind in the spray. Pretty frightening stuff. Um, and what they determined, um, one of the individuals at a small conservation organization determined um, was that the DDT was actually causing the shells of these birds to be, uh, these birds' eggs to be very thin and basically unable to withstand the weight of the incubating parent. And so what you got is crushed eggs. Um, and uh, what what this um, small band of individuals decided to do was something that had never ever been done before, which is to sue on the behalf of the environment, never done before. Um, and so what they were, what the, it was seven individuals, um, and so they eventually won um, a ban of the aerial spraying of DDT in Suffolk County and then the state of New York, and then in 1972 they went all the way to the Supreme Court and banned the aerial spraying of DDT nationwide. So that's our origins. Um, now we're close to 600 staff from seven. Um, we are uh, located um, in multiple offices around the world. Uh, we have four core program areas, oceans, ecosystems, climate, and health, uh, my team. And so I'll now shift to talk about a couple of the examples of how the health team goes about doing its work. Okay, so um, why are we concerned about harmful chemicals? Uh, because we know that we're exposed to them. Um, and so, uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, the CDC conducts something called the NHANES survey where they actually look at the blood and urine of Americans and evaluate what chemicals are in the blood and urine of Americans, and there are several hundred, including in the blood and urine of pregnant women. Um, and there's also additional research that shows that these chemicals show up in the cord blood of pregnant women, meaning that these chemicals circulate into, through the fetus. Um, so very disconcerting. And there's a whole host of chemicals that are found um, in these biological samples, uh, fingerprints of coal-fired power plants, diesel exhaust, um, chemicals in personal and household products, inks, dyes, um, a whole soup of things that we've heard um, throughout the day. Um, and so the other thing at the same time is that we know that some of these chemicals are hazardous, not all of them, but some of them. Um, and including, as um, Katie just mentioned, that some of these chemicals can be harmful at even very low levels of exposure, particularly when those exposures are happening during critical windows of 
uh, development. And unfortunately, um, we've had um, in place, or if we're actually not in place, um, any semblance of a strong regulatory or market-based system to um, you know, nip these chemicals in the butt. So typically the practice has been over the past several decades that we introduce these chemicals into the environment and um, ask questions about their long-term health implications later, which has gotten us into the current situation of now figuring out how to manage. But we are making progress. Um, so um, how to tackle this problem? EDF uses uh, what we describe as three levers of change. Um, first, we're very much focused on um, securing strong health protective regulations to ensure that chemical hazards and risks are adequately managed. Most of our work in the health team has actually been at the federal level, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, we also work with businesses to help inform their decisions as to what chemicals they put on their products or on their shelves, depending if they're a product manufacturer or if they are a retailer. Um, so we, we sort of spur their leadership in this space. Um, and then third, um, we work on accelerating the advancement of scientific research on the health effects of chemicals because we know enough to know that there's a problem, but we know far too little about the entire, uh, of the full scope of the problem. Um, and so I actually find myself, as I think Patrick suggested, kind of involved in all three of these areas for better or for worse, but it keeps it interesting, I'll just say that. Um, so we heard earlier today about the Toxic Substances Control Act. Tim gave a nice introduction into that law. Um, he did mention that it was not effective and didn't really work for anyone. And to just put a finer point on that, um, uh, uh, since the time that TOSCO was originally enacted in 1976, EPA has only been able to require testing of 3% of the 80,000 chemicals that have ever been noticed to the agency and has only regulated five. Uh, we're hopeful with the reform of TOSCA that this, these numbers will change. Um, and it had been 40 years since the law uh, was passed, since it had been updated. And we know uh, way more than we did 40 years ago about environmental stressors and how they can impact health. Um, and also, during this, over the course of these 40 years, we've seen a tremendous growth, 25-fold increase in the um, volume of chemicals on the marketplace. So, um, fortunately, uh, about almost a year ago, uh, we, President Obama signed into law the Frank R. Lautenberg Chemical Safety Act to sort of turn the tide, if you will, on what had been uh, an ineffective law. Um, the one thing to mention is that this was passed with bipartisan support, although I do think that Tim mentioned that. Um, and it was the first piece of major environmental legislation that's been passed in 20 years. Not insignificant considering the political climate, even, within, even when this law um, was passed a year ago. Um, so uh, Tim mentioned a few things about what this new law now enables the agency to do. I'll just mention a few of these, um, a few of these things again. The law now requires the EPA to um, uh, assess all chemicals existing in the market as well as new chemicals coming into the market. There are some 700 new chemicals noticed to the agency each year. Um, it has to evaluate these chemicals on a safety uh, against the safety standard that is based solely on health and not on cost, as it had been previously. Um, it also gives EPA deadlines and resources. Deadlines and resources are really good. The agency did not have deadlines or resources, really, um, under, the, under the old law. And it also gives EPA more authority to require testing of chemicals, um, something that it had been challenged um, to do as um, represented by that 3% figure I just mentioned. Okay. So I'm not going to go into the details of this, of this diagram. I just put it up here to sort of show this is um, the process by which existing chemicals will eventually be uh, assessed and potentially managed under the new law. Um, the reason why I throw it up is, well, two reasons. One, to speak to what EDF does, we are intimately involved in informing the agency and sort of sharing the public's perspective on, or hoping to share the public's perspective on how these things should be done. Um, there are fundamental processes that, that the agency has to um, develop within a, law, within a year of the law's enactment, and we are coming up on that year in 13 days. So this is a very exciting time for us uh, Tosca junkies. Um, some of the things that it has to do, 
is um, reset what's called the chemical inventory. Believe it or not, we do not know how many chemicals are, in actually, are actually in active commerce. Nobody knows the answer to that question. So they're setting up a process for figuring out what that active inventory, how to develop that active inventory. They're setting up a process t um, as to, for how to, once we have this, active, uh, this uh, inventory of active chemicals, how to prioritize them as either high or low. Um, the process then for how high priority chemicals will be evaluated for their risks, and then depending on that risk determination, um, what risk management is necessary to um, manage that risk adequately so that the chemical no longer presents unreasonable risk for um, use the, t the, the appropriate uh, technical legal parlance. So um, EPA, with these framework rules, put out its proposal for how it, how it plans to go about doing these things um, just before the new administration came into office. Um, we've weighed in heavily um, in, uh, in, our, um, in sharing our perspective on how these things should be done, and we eagerly await to see what the outcomes will be in um, just a few weeks, uh, hopefully, if they make that first deadline. Um, and we will be vocal about that. Stay read our blog, we'll be, praying, we'll be sharing our opinions of, um, as to what they've gotten right, and maybe hopefully not too much of what they've gotten wrong, but it's, it's a different world now, so we shall see. Um, the other thing that the law did was require EPA to um, identify the first set of 10 chemicals to conduct a risk evaluation, so EPA was told that um, within six months of enactment, it, of enactment of the law, it had to identify the first 10 chemicals it would evaluate, they are listed here. The reason that the law, oh my God. Okay, so here they are. Um, I'm gonna just start booking through. So just of interest, um, the other thing um, that, that is going to happen is that EPA is gonna, I feel your pain, um, Anne, um, <laughs> is um, publish the scopes of these, of these risk evaluations. And so the scope is gonna actually say what is gonna be involved in us evaluating the risk of each of these 10 chemicals Again, something that we are very interested in seeing and we'll be weighing in on. Okay, so I'm gonna to shift to some of our market work. Um, while in parallel, we've been, you know, obviously um, knee deep, neck deep, head deep, really, um, in policies related issues, we have um, concurrently, hmm, some images aren't coming up, um, concurrently working really hard to drive market changes, um, market solutions to hazardous chemicals. Um, and that's uh, A, to sort of, while we think regulations sort of set a floor, market, uh, markets, companies can move faster than regulations at times and they can help to set a ceiling. Um, so uh, we want to encourage companies to do that and we also want to show that it's technically and economically feasible for companies to do, uh, to make better decisions about chemicals. Our um, biggest partnership um, that we have um, to date with the companies with Walmart um, and the reason being is that they are one of the largest retailers in the world. So when Walmart makes a decision about what chemicals it is or is not going to use, um, that has huge ripple effects across the supply chain. And so we see them as a very powerful lever. Um, and we worked with them um, very, uh, fairly closely to develop a chemicals policy that was released three years ago. Um, and they actually reported their progress on that policy for the first time last year and they reported a 95% volume reduction in um, eight so-called high priority chemicals and a 45% reduction in many, many more what they call priority chemicals. Um, and they're continuing this work and they actually have interesting things that they're thinking about doing in the near term, so stay tuned for that. Um, the other thing that we do, as I mentioned earlier, is we do a lot of work in, this, in, the, in the sort of science of the issue. Um, I'm not gonna speak to all of it, I'm just gonna showcase one thing that we've been working on in the past, uh, for the past year, um, and that is getting better data on exposures. There's inadequate hazard information, um, as those of you who are in this field are, know. Um, we, we do have a number of data gaps when it comes to hazard, but there's also significant data gaps when it turn, in terms of understanding um, exposures, who's exposed, at what time, at what levels, et cetera. And one of the things we've been interested in thinking about is, are there technologies and tools that we can bring uh, <coughs> into, into this space to help us get a better sense of what those exposures are? Um, 
So uh, one tool that we've been exploring, we actually did a, a pilot exercise last year, is um, uh, using um, passive personal um, uh, wristband samplers. So this is a wristband that was actually developed by Oregon State University and then commercialized by a company called My Exposome. These wristbands can detect um, today uh, up to 1,400 chemicals. Um, we, as I said, we've done a, a small pilot study to sort of get our, our, our feet wet, if you will, in terms of what the capabilities of this technology are, and also really importantly to think about how you communicate the results um, of, of using this type of tool to a, a lay person who may not be a tox expert. Um, so um, this is just a, so just, just a one slide. So we, one thing that we did is we did a flame retardant panel um, on, on a wristbands of 28 participants. And what's really interesting, and again, that's a very small sample size, so we can't, you know, over-interpret this data by any means. But nevertheless, what was really interesting to us is that even in this sample of 28 individuals, this is a, a, a log scale, um, a log scale here on the, on the y-axis, um, is that there was a pretty good spread um, of, uh, of, um, concentrations of the chemicals in the wristband across the participants. So um, that in itself was interesting to us. Um, so now what we're doing, we actually have just started a project that we're calling the Year of Innovation. And we're thinking about, we've partnered with um, a program at EDF called EDF Plus Biz. Um, and we're joining forces to think about how we can bring these types of tools and technologies into um, into the fray, if you will, in a way that's uh, economical, scalable, and then obviously scientifically defensible. So um, I will stop with that. There's my happy people when you have less toxic chemical exposures. This is true. Um, and there's my contact information. Thank you.